Welcome to more World of Warplanes content from the Noble Q. In this video, I'm going to look at the Tier 7 American Premium Heavy Fighter, the Fisher XP-75 Eagle. Hello there, and here on the tarmac outside my hangar is the XP-75 Eagle, a Frankenstein's monster of an aircraft, undercarriage coming from an F4U Corsair, wing panels are eventually coming from P-40 Warhawks, although originally they were intended to come from P-51 Mustangs, the original tail assembly from a Douglas A-24, although this had to be redesigned. Imagined originally as a fast climbing interceptor, the idea changed to a long range uh, escort fighter, and a number of prototypes were built with six production models also making it off the lines and going into testing. However, that's as far as this aircraft got. The United States decided to standardize the range of aircraft it was operating and this project was dropped towards the end of the war. In the game, it's one of the original premiums. It has relatively low DPS machine guns, although these were helped by the buff to the 50 cals of over a year ago. High maneuverability for a tier 7 premium aircraft, more on that in a moment though, and relatively quick, and it carries a pair of useful bombs. Of course the problem with this is, it's tier 7, and therefore it will face mostly tier 8s in its battles, and in these days that means it's going to come across twin Mustangs and particularly P-61 Black Widows, and that makes this sometimes an aircraft that is difficult to fly. What we'll do now is look at the numbers. If you don't want to look at a spreadsheet, which I'm afraid I think means that you'll be missing out on a lot, you can use a link below the video to skip ahead to another part of it. Here we have a spreadsheet showing all of the tier 7 heavies. There are eight of them, half of which are premiums. If you don't know how this spreadsheet works, use the link below to an instructional video. Have a look at that and then you will know what's going on here. So with that, let's talk about the gun armament, and we have a rating of 29 and a cumulative DPS of 540. Let me scroll downwards straight away, and there's something interesting going on here. This is actually the second worst in class rating, however the cumulative DPS is considerably better than that. However, the reason for that is because a couple of the aircraft here, the Ki-93 and the Jupiler Tu-1, are rated lower on DPS, but they're both sniper aircraft. They are used in different ways. The only aircraft which is broadly similar, which the DPS outclasses here, is in fact the Hornet. So in aircraft that are not sniper aircraft, this is actually the second worst DPS. And that's after the buff to the 50 cals that came about a year ago. What we have are six wing-mounted 50 cal machine guns, or 12.7 millimeters as they're described in the game, and four synchronized uh, 50 cal machine guns. However, the synchronization does not produce any reduction in DPS. All of these guns are rated at 54 with a rate of fire of 750. The range is only 1877 feet, which I find too short, but some of you may be able to live with. However, on the plus side, we've got a relatively good auto aim angle, the amount you can be off target by and the game correction range for you of three degrees. A good dispersion angle for machine guns of only 0 0.6, 0 0.8 is much more common. A nice long overheat time of 25 seconds, but a rather low shell velocity of 1,020 feet per second. You need to give quite a bit of lead with these machine guns. It can be difficult to find initially until you've played for a couple of minutes. It's the only heavy with exclusively machine gun armament in this comparison. Everything else has at least 20 millimeter cannons, and some of them have rather bigger than that. For instance, this Key 94-1, which has got the highest EPS rating because it has the twin 37 millimeters and the twin 30 millimeter cannons. Um, do not go head on with this aircraft. It's conceivable that it will have been proved to a point where it has tier 10 DPS rather than tier 7 DPS. It is possible to get that figure up to 1101 and some people do it. I do, for instance. I suppose it most closely resembles the Arsenal BB-10 in terms of its characteristics, um, but even that has 20mm um, cannons um, to hit a little bit harder. The long and short of it is, if you like using Mustangs, then you'll be quite familiar with the kind of play that you need with the XP-75 Eagle. No defensive armament. Some of the aircraft in this comparison do have that, not this one. Ordnance, it's okay. It's not exactly an afterthought, although it's not the primary function of this aircraft. A pair of 500 kilogram bombs doing 8,600 damage each. 
resupply time is three minutes though awfully long uh, the damage rate radius is a usable 246 feet most of the bombs are, um, are that or above in this comparison it is definitely not going to be used primarily in a ground attacking role whereas you would for instance definitely push both the tiger cat with its rockets and bombs and the hornet similarly with rockets and bombs more towards that sphere of operations than that of a true air superiority fighter survivability it's low when compared to some of the other heavies in fact some of the fighters are going to have better survivability than this so i think we should say that this is relatively fragile aircraft you don't really want to get hit in it too much only 400 hit points damage resistance is 48 fire resistance is reasonably high at 60 which is useful because that gives you the ability to fit um mount a first aid dressing package airspeed decent 64 Cruise speed is second best in class, 360. The boost maximum speed, however, lets it down a bit. There are three other aircraft that are going to boost above it here. The Zwilling, for instance, um, the, the Key 94-1. A little bit surprisingly, because that feels like a brick when you fly it. And funny enough, the Hornet can really motor when it's under boost, although that's got a relatively low cruise speed. Boost duration on the short side for a heavy only 20 seconds and you can see over here that there are aircraft with considerably more 40 seconds for the arsenal vb10 30 seconds for a pair of aircraft here 45 seconds for the tu-1 maneuverability well as far as tier 7 heavies go this is where this aircraft scores it's the most maneuverable by considerable distance um the closest competitor is the vb10 which is why it's beside it and we've got uh, 13.1 seconds to turn 360 degrees and 90 uh, uh, degree, uh, uh, degrees per second roll rate. Controllability for what that's worth, this is how quickly the aircraft responds when you give an instruction through a control surface to change direction, is best in class along with the Arsenal VB10. There isn't much in it, to be truthful. The figures are very close across the board, with the worst being um, the tuple of here the tu1 and even that 77.1 which is certainly within touching distance of the 78.5 uh, you're not going to be able to stay on the tails of rapidly maneuvering fighters who pull uh, extreme maneuvers to get away from you so minimum optimum speed 252 need to try and keep the aircraft fairly fast at all times maximum optimum speed is actually highest at 540 which is good so you've got a very healthy range of 288 miles an hour an hour in which your characteristics do not degrade second best in class the zwilling is the best in class here just 10 miles an hour more stall speed 106 altitude performance um it's okay it's up there with most of these heavies the key 93 the in theory can get higher second the zwilling there's not going to be enough in it to make it a serious disadvantage to you the climb rate is a reasonably good 418 which is second best in class um, the Zwilling is the fastest and you can stand this aircraft on its tail and get away certainly from turn fighters um, so that reflects perhaps the original design idea of this aircraft uh, climb rate uh, um, being important to a fast climbing interceptor going to the worst in class figures we've already talked about the armament and the pecu peculiarities there ordnance it's okay even though it's showing up as red here the main reason it's showing up is red because of the presence of the tiger cat and the hornet which are much more uh, directed at attacking ground targets survivability you can see a lot of red i did say it was fairly fragile for a heavy airspeed the boost duration that's being highlighted there um, so you want to conserve that and manage it extremely well in this aircraft otherwise you won't be able to flee from pursuing aircraft maneuverability um, the controllability figures are compressed there in fact that's the wrong way around it's actually highlighting as worst in class what's best in class there fix that in the, uh, after i finish the video um, the minimum optimum speed, just emphasizing that this aircraft ought to be kept quick at all times if possible. Otherwise, the aircraft, if you really slow it down, the characteristics of its maneuverability will degrade. And we can see the altitude performance, um, some uh, reddish figures appearing there. So again, although it's not bad and it's competitive enough with all the other heavies, um, it is on the lower side um, rather than the higher side. So where does that position this aircraft? Well, I tend to fly it like a Shudo Mustang, and I'll build it for speed, although when you come to see the setup section, you'll see that there is a bit of a problem with that in terms of the slots that you've got available to you. And 
The other thing that I need to do, particularly in tier eight battles, is very carefully select where I'm going to do my fighting. Because if the enemy has nowadays most likely P61s on the enemy team, you do not want to go anywhere near those unless you are going to be able to knock them down. And given they're built like tanks, your opportunities to knock them down are going to be fairly limited. So careful placement of this aircraft is uh, important. Careful use of the bombs in order to flip sectors, possibly secondary sectors like garrisons, um, will be important to you. Pursuing light fighters and shooting them down at fairly close range will be important to you. Use the classic high energy techniques of flying high and fast, staying off the flaps, diving on aircraft and then boosting away. But you've got short boost, you need to make sure you manage that. So all in all, this feels like it could be quite a tricky aircraft to fly. Fortunately, because I can make great use of my maneuverability skills, I actually find it quite a pleasant aircraft to fly. But I do need to make sure that I've positioned it carefully, particularly out of range of threats uh, to it with which it cannot cope, such as those twin Mustangs, such as those P61s, and certainly high altitude fighters that are fast. All that said, let's go and see how I've set the aircraft up. Here we are back with the XP-75 and my aircraft is specialised. That means I have all of the equipment and consumable slots available. When you first get this aircraft, you'll be missing a slot off the engine. And that's unfortunate because you have two slots in the engine. This is going to quite adversely affect the aircraft. So flying this stock is going to be quite a bit less pleasant than flying it specialised and it's already challenging when it's specialised. You'll also be missing a slot on the engine for the consumable so you'll be unable to for instance mount both engine cooling and a restart bottle. Bit of an inconvenience too. Let's pop this aircraft back into its specialised configuration and I'll show you what I've done with it. And you are a bit limited by this particular configuration of slots in my opinion. No airframe slot me slots means that you've got f fewer options in how you might want to configure this aircraft. I've gone for the gun sight, not surprising there. It's not calibrated at the moment, but bonus characteristics, 10% chance of causing a fire, not surprising uh, on machine guns, 10% chance of inflicting critical damage. And I've chosen the 3% accuracy of forward firing armament there. These are the choices that I would make. Your alternatives are inflicting another 5% uh, critical damage or 5% accuracy when firing at moving targets or 5% uh, pilot's resistance to damage. Now, those bottom two there would also be good choices. And if you go for the short range configuration on these guns, that is, you don't improve what is quite a short range, then maybe then the accuracy when firing at moving targets will be less important to you and you'd prefer to take the pilot's resistance to injuries. I'm happy with mine however i've gone for long gun barrels and i am tempted to take off um, the three percent accuracy and put on the five percent accuracy when moving at firing at moving targets because you remember the shell velocity is quite low on these guns and maybe that would help more i don't know it's worth trying we can't do anything on the airframe and i think that's a bit of a botheration personally but we do have slot two slots on the engine. I've chosen to emphasize speed on this aircraft, so I've put in both the uprated engine and the boost mixture injection system. On the boost mixture injection system, again, not calibrated, it's a tier seven aircraft, so I don't put a great deal of effort into it. Um, but you could, as you see, get another 78 points worth of calibration there if you really wanted and improve the acceleration with boost, improve that maximum speed with boost ac activated. Bonus characteristics there of engine cooldown rate, 10% improvement, 5% boost av availability to uh, offset the 15% negative effect of mounting the boost mixture injection system. You can see that characteristic in red there. And then 5% uh, extra cooldown rate, so that's 15% in all. What else could you do here? You can try and improve the acceleration, um, 1%. You can try and improve the maximum speed with boost or you can try and exceed the maximum speed with boost again so you could do one and a half percent i'm happy with my characteristics but it is worth playing around with the others to find the ones that suit you on the uprated engine the again not calibrated so there's another 78 points worth of calibration to come so we can improve that acceleration without boost and also critically for me that um, cruise speed and if I were to put effort into this aircraft in terms of calibrating this is the piece of equipment I would calibrate first I've already done the one on the um, forward firing weapon as it happens 
The bad news here is the resistance to fire, we're down by 23%. However, I've offset it with a bonus characteristic which reduces that effect to 13%. And then I've gone for acceleration without boost of 1% and cruise speed improvement of 1%. Alternatives there, another half percent of maximum speed with boost activated would be a good characteristic to go for. Maybe another 5% worth, 5% cooldown rate. Um, or a half percent cruise speed. Again, I'm happy with these characteristics, but there's no reason not to play around with the three that I haven't selected. Here, I think, is the, an important decision, and I think, really, you've got two ways to go here. Let's discount the reinforced belt carriers. You don't really need to improve the burst length or something with 25 seconds worth of burst. That leaves you with the long gun barrels. For me, this is the important choice. I think that 1,877 feet is too short a, a limiting factor in terms of range, and therefore the long gun barrels are good for me. However, you've also got fairly limited DPS. There's a strong argument for mounting the gas-operated action and improving the DPS. So what I've done uh, in the post-build effects section, I will show you the effects of my build with the long gun barrels, and also the effects of a build using the gas operated action and additionally I'll drop the boost mixture injection system and put it on the lightweight power unit which if you're looking for maximum maneuverability is something you would probably do here uh, you might drop the uprated engine instead but I'm going to show you it with um, the boost mixture injection system having been dropped so what do we get with the long gun barrels and these I have taken care to very nearly calibrate right to the top of the scale it's at 470 as you can see there so I get an over 15% improvement in firing range I get a nasty nearly 20% reduction in burst length and then on bonus characteristics I've gone for 10% chance of inflicting critical damage 5% extra damage to be inflicted by the forward firing offensive armament so I am increasing my DPS to a, a degree here well 5% of course and then an, another extra 3% firing range. Other characteristics here, 5% chance of inflicting critical damage, 5% increased accuracy, or another 5% burst length. And if I were to pick another characteristic, it would be that extra 5% burst length and offset that rather nasty 19% drop off there. Which one would I drop? Probably the 3% firing range of forward uh, firing offensive armament in order to accommodate that bonus characteristic. Okay, so if we move on to consumables, despite having an uprated engine, the survivability is still good enough. Resistance to fire is rated at 51 just up there. Um, so I've been able to mount the first aid dressing package, which is good because pilots get shot out a lot these days. For a bit of extra maneuverability in battles, I've gone for the pneumatic control assist, and then with both of these slots being available, it's the regular engine cooling. If you have at least one second's worth of boost, this will give you another 10 seconds on top. If you've got all your boost, you'll, a boost, you'll get another 10 seconds on top of that as well, which would make 35 in theory. And then the engine restart bottle, since heavies don't really like going slowly and being caught up by everything and being shot to bits. On the ammunition, I'm using up um, gold ammunition simply because I'm trying to reduce my exposure to wargaming with my uh, level of gold, which is at 63,000 at the moment. I recommend you mount uh, universal ammunition. If you are going to use real money for your ammunition, then use the incendiary ammunition here. One point, I've used uh, a special pilot here, and we're going to dis discuss pilot skills next to improve the maneuverability of the aircraft take that pilot out of the equation and then you need to reconsider your equipment um, choices and you may very well lean towards putting on that lightweight power unit which is why I'm going to show you the effect of it. Okay, pilot skills then. Here we have the dialogue box for the special pilot that I've just mentioned. No surprises, it's Elise Clark. I use her everywhere I can because of this skill here which is the Maneuver Expert skill, giving uh, extra 4% maneuverability and decreasing the effect of sustained critical damage to um, wings and tails, so retaining maneuverability even when you have critical air services damaged um, because the effect of uh, the damage is reduced by 25%. You do lose this skill here, of course, the P-51D Master, I don't mind. Uh, and this confers upon this aircraft the extra maneuverability that I would not otherwise have to use a lightweight power unit to get. That all said, this is a crew trainer. I would never sp uh, specifically build a pilot for this plane. I would use it as a crew trainer. And I am training Elise Clark to try and get her final skill points. Um, but if I were to try and build this aircraft, with uh, give this aircraft a special pilot, 
it would depend on my equipment choices. Under my build, which is a pure speed build, I definitely would be going aerodynamics expert first, and then I would be trying to get engine guru one. Next would be marksman one, and then I would take that off in favor of en engine guru two, and then build back probably to marksman one. Might possibly consider demolition expert, but I think that's a wee bit down the line. I'd probably go up to, um, once I've got the marksman skills, I'd probably be looking to try and get something like cruise flight next. Now, if you aren't going to be using Elise Clark and you are going to be using a lightweight power unit, you might want to do it a little bit differently. Probably go aerodynamics expert first. I would probably still go engine guru one, but there'd be an argument for going for aer aerobatics expert first and then back to engine, uh, engine guru one. So those skills, possibly interchangeable, either your second or your third skill. And then marksman one, but take it off and probably put on engine guru two. Or if you want to improve the accuracy of the machine guns, because you're one of those who think that machine guns are pretty awful and need all the help they can get, you'd actually go marksman two uh, first. And then eventually you'd be getting up into this rank here. Suppose you might just use evasive target, not usual for to use it on heavy fighters. Back in the day when this would have been one of the most maneuverable heavies out there, it might have been a good choice. These days, I think you're so likely to face P61s that even with this skill, you're probably going to be outclassed if you get into a battle with one of those. The secret with those is to either pick them off when they're heavily damaged or just don't go anywhere near them. In which case, I would go for cruise flight. So that's a quick overview of the kind of skill set that you would be expecting to put on your pilots, depending on which kind of build you would choose. I think it's time we went and looked at uh, the post-build effects. Here we have a workbook or spreadsheet showing the effects of my choices on the base characteristics of the aircraft. The base characteristics are in columns C and D. You'll have seen these before if you looked at the aircraft statistics section. And then the changes that have been made by my choices of equipment, equipment levels, pilot skills, choice of camouflage, and that is relevant here. I've got a chrome camouflage mode, uh, mounted and so on and so on are in columns E and F. The absolute difference is expressed in columns G and the difference in percentage terms is uh, expressed in column H. This is for the setup that you've just seen, which is a gun sight, boost mixture injection system, an uprated engine and long gun barrels. There is a second build here, which you haven't seen. Gun sight, lightweight power unit, uprated engine, and gas-operated action on the guns. The effects there, and these are all ne not necessarily fully calibrated, just like the other ones are, so these figures are somewhat indicative, are shown in columns I and J. The difference in absolute terms in column K, and the difference in percentage terms in column L. So let's go back to the build that you've just seen. And we'll talk about the guns. We've got an improvement in the rating up to 31, which is 6.9%. Um, more importantly, we've got the cumulative DPS up to 567. And that's coming from the bonus characteristic, adding 5% extra damage. So the DPS on the guns has gone up to 56.7 in all cases, whether they're wing mounted or synchronized through the propeller. No effect on the rate of fire. Here's the thing that I really wanted, a decent increase in the range of the weaponry. It's up to 2,219 feet. For me, this makes this aircraft so much nicer to use. No effect on the auto angle, still three degrees, which is relatively good. We have managed to get the dispersion angle down to 0.47, a 22% improvement. So the guns are much more accurate. The adverse effect here though is I've lost very nearly five seconds worth of burst length. Now you've still got 20 seconds which I think is perfectly adequate um, but if you really really are wincing at that then the way to avoid it is by using I guess gas operated action as you'll see we discussed the other build. No change to shell velocity there's nothing you can do to affect that. No, Nothing was done to the ordnance so it's exactly the same we'll move over that. We've got some adverse effects on survivability here. The rating is still 10, but the damage resistance has gone down by a point, and we're down by eight points on fire resistance. Airspeed, it's gone up to 68, and what we've got is a fairly in healthy increase on the cruise speed of 36 miles an hour to make the aircraft fly through the air consistently more quickly, and also an increase of um, airspeed of 22 miles an hour under boost which is good as well. Now what we have lost is two seconds worth of boost. It's already a short boost, so if you're going to use this configuration, you're just going to have to manage that boost even more carefully. No effect on the dive speed, that can't be affected by choices on equipment, etc, etc. Maneuverability, four point gain, 8.7% improvement. What we've got here is the time to turn 360 degrees down to 12.3 seconds or just above that. 
which is a very nearly a 6% improvement. Roll rate is um, improved to about 96. That's probably not going to make a lot of difference. No other effects here. And then we've also got a pretty useful improvement coming from the boost mixture injection system, largely of 24 feet per second in the climb rate. Other things that have been done which aren't shown in the UI, we've got a 20% improvement in criticals coming from the guns and a 10% improvement in a chance of causing a fire. Also, the cooldown for the guns is improved by 15%. Coming from Elise Clark, we've got uh, less problems when we have a damaged control surface or surfaces. Um, the effect of that is reduced by 25% because of the presence of Elise Clark. We also have 12% more likelihood of a pilot injury, unfortunately. Air speed, the engines will cool down 15% quicker. The acceleration with no boost is 13.5% quicker. And this aircraft actually does have pretty good power to weight ratios, which I haven't mentioned previously in the video. So provided the drag isn't bad, and unfortunately we don't know anything about drag, this will make this aircraft just feel that much more nimble, um, especially with another 12.1% acceleration with boost. One thing the UI misses is that I have a chrome camouflage fitted to the aircraft. This gives an extra 3% on the cruise speed. I've included that in the calculation just above. You won't see it in the UI. That will show 384, for instance, or something similar to that. And the last thing to mention uh, in terms of the base characteristics of the aircraft is that we've got a 6% improvement in your manoeuvrability. Now, I will just remind you that we have a special air, a pilot in the aircraft, so things will change if you are training one of your standard pilots for another plane. The other build substitutes a lightweight power unit for the boost mixture injection, injection system and gas operated action for the long gun barrels. So the big thing about the gas operated action is it's going to get your DPS up to very nearly 600 and many of you will welcome this. Uh, the DPS on each individual gun is very nearly 60. The rate of fire has gone up by 10.3%. These are all 10.3% increases because there's one characteristic affecting all three of these. Um, rate of fire has gone up to 827 or just above, but the bad news is that you now reduce to 1,877 feet worth of range. This is not for me. Uh, I prefer the extra range, but it may be for you. You may prefer that extra DPS and what a shame we can't combine both of them. No effect on the autoham angle. We've still improved the dispersion angle to 0.5, which is still very good for machine guns. Now we've got the full 25 seconds burst, which again, you may very well welcome. Of course, no change to shell velocity. Survivability has changed a little, still lost a point of damage resistance. Um, in fact, actually, it's exactly the same. There's no changes here. It's the same as the previous build, I beg your pardon. Airspeed has changed very slightly in terms of rating. It's now 67 instead of 68 for the previous build, but the base is 64, so it's still three points better. Still got that 396 cruise speed because we've got the uprated engine, but now we're back to the standard uh, maximum boost speed of 422. However, we now have the full 20 seconds worth of burst. And on the maneuverability, we're up to 54. Bearing in mind, this is still with the special PR pilot, Elise Clark. If you take Elise Clark, you're going to fall back towards this kind of figure here. And we've now managed to get the turn time down between uh, below 12 seconds. The roll rate is still 95.47, so an improvement of 6% or so there. Other effects, 15% cooldown rate of the guns, 10% criticals this time instead of 20, and 10% extra chance of fire. Again, because we've got Elise Clark in the aircraft, we've still got that reduction in the uh, lack, loss of controllability of the aircraft when the control services are damaged. 25% uh, improvement there. Now we have 7% more likelihood of damage to the engine, or 7% uh, engine damage resistance is reduced, I should say, because that is more likelihood of damage to the engine. And we've also still got that 12% pilot injury resistance reduction as well. As far as, far as acceleration is concerned, it's now 14.9% uh, uh, without boost, but only 4.4% with boost. And we've got a fairly big 15.1% increase in your maneuverability. Bearing in mind this is the least part. If you don't put a least cark in this plane, um, then your maneuverability is going to feel much more like the preceding build. But that gives you the opportunity to train an American pilot for a different plane. Right, those are the post-build effects. Let's go and see how the aircraft performs in battle.
The map for the forthcoming battle is Plateau. It's the Weapon of Revenge variant. This is a five sector map, pretty much laid out in the five spots of a die configuration. It's a little bit squashed. And what we have in the middle is a military base, and this is strategically and tactically the most important sector on the map. Strategically, it fires rockets at enemy sectors to try to flip them to you, which is immensely helpful. And it's in the center, therefore it provides easy access to all of the other sectors. On one axis about the military base, we have two air bases, one near each spawn point. Um, and these will allow you perhaps to get to the enemy garrison, but apart from that, they're more limited than they would be if they were in the middle. You can also select a different aircraft of the same tier if you're destroyed or get full repairs. And then on the other axis, again, one sector near each spawn point, there are garrisons, the make weights in this game. Now you may think that the best way to win this map would be to hold your local um, sectors and then the military base for at least longer than the enemy team, and that's a valid approach. In practice, what often happens, because this is a spawn point, what happens is that uh, you tend to hold an air base and perhaps the enemy local garrison and the military base. And if you hold those three sectors longer than the enemy manages to hold these three sectors, you will win the game. On the order of battle, we can see that I have an unspecialized F7F Tiger Cat Heavy for company at tier seven with my XP75. And then we have three tier sixes, an IL-22 Grand Attacker, a Key 88 Japanese uh, aircraft premium, not specialized. Fires more like a BF-109F, but has say a cannon like an Aero Cobra. So it's not a, your typical Japanese fighter. And then a specialized LA-5. The enemy have a, an unspecialized Spitfire 9. They have a specialized ground attacker, the ME265, which means that they might be competitive at the center more so than us. Although, of course, the Tiger Cat is carrying a lot of ordnance and I've got a pair of useful bombs as well. They also have a P38L, very maneuverable, hits pretty well, but again, absolutely laden with ordnance. So again, maybe at the start of the battle, they're gonna have an advantage. Uh, an F4U1, also got rockets, of course, and then a highly maneuverable A6M5. That, however, will struggle to get about the map and be effective in more than one area of it. So quite an interesting balance of aircraft here. Let's go and see how the battle panned out. As we head into battle, I'll mention that this is a natively recorded replay file, not one of the World of Warplanes team's files. That means that you'll see the reticle aimed correctly, you'll see me use sniper mode, and also looking around the map. We're going to head straight for the military base, it's the most important sector on the map. Gaining altitude, not too um, aggressively. We're already at a decent height. We're looking for the uh, heavy ADAs. And we're always bearing in mind that those will try and set you up so that the first one draws you into a position that the second one can shoot you. There's the first one. Not sure where the second one is. Got to be aware of that. Begin to shoot at it. And then an arrow appears on the map. Unfortunately, it's down to my left and not to my right as I'd half anticipated. But I'm able to bring my guns to bear on it and make it break off. Swing round. Got to be quick here because the enemy have already made a decent start to capturing the sector, so that's the first ADA down. Size up the second and begin to shoot it. Now, one of the red arrows right at the bottom of the screen has got big, so I need to turn and address that threat. It turns out to be a bot K1 or key one or two. And it's interested in the ADA as well, which means that it presents itself for easy shooting by me. Down it goes, and now I can shoot the ADA, and we reverse the start that the enemy has made. I'm in the vicinity of a bomber, I look around and I can see that there are no immediate threats so I can target this bomber, get him down and it will help us capture this sector. Don't really need to use sniper mode here, off side of the aircraft a little bit. Now we destroy the A26B and we have this sector. We made a strong start, the team has also got our local um, garrison and uh, airbase. Dispose the second bomber. You can see the limitation of the DPS here. This is a tier 6 bomber. I'm taking quite a while to knock it down. And I was getting some help there as well. Now we're looking around to see what needs to be done next. There are three aircraft off to the right. Don't want to fly into the middle of three aircraft, but they will probably split up. So I'm going to head towards them gently and see what they do. With a bit of luck, be able to get some shots on them. The first one that comes near me is the P38L to shoot it. It rams me, which is fairly um, low uh, attack. Well, he had not much chance of success, let's put it that way. 
So he's destroyed. I've lost quite a bit of health though. I take down the Infocable 190D Dora. I now have a Spitfire behind me. There it is. So I just race away from it and I'm going to pick up repairs. Now those of you who are alert may have noticed in that panel that the P38L player decided to come back in a key 102. Obviously thought that he needed more manoeuvrability against perhaps my plane, for instance. Military base is not under too much threat, so I decide that I will go for this garrison. I'm keeping a very careful eye on the Spitfire that originally was chasing me, although disengaged and is now busy doing something else. And he's going in against our specialised LA-5. In this distance, as far as I can tell, the LA-5 has got the better of him. And indeed that proves to be true, and that's the critical kill that flips that sector. I can chase down the Focke Wolf 190D again. Begins to come into range. Can't even complete a full wheel of death before I shoot it down. And now the military base is looking as if it's under significant threat from numbers of aircraft, so that's where we need to go next. I can see a bomber. I can also see a heavy, which is attacking an ADA virtually in front of me right now. Keeping a very close head eye on that heavy. It looks as if I can safely attack the A26B, so that's what I'm going to do. And again the DPS, just working against me a little bit here. Takes a while. But we have the bomber. Swing round. Three aircraft in front of me. Might shoot the Corsair. And suddenly the enemy flips this from nowhere. And it turns out that the A6M50 is the next aircraft that comes in front of me, so I destroy that. I'm now going to hunt down the bomber to make sure it can't go to another sector and flip yet another one to the enemy. And as you can see, 567 DPS it takes a while to knock down a tier 6 bomber in this plane. Now the ADAs have spawned, you can see one that's standing still in the sky, wait for it to move, it moves at a very sluggish pace, but it also doesn't take as much damage as I expect, although I do set it on fire. So I swing around using the manoeuvrability I've got in this aircraft, looks like it would burn out but I destroy it to be on the safe side. Here's where the extra range up comes in useful, I can start shooting this at 2200 feet, it would have taken a little bit longer to labour up to 1800 feet. See the specialised Key 102, this is the aircraft into which the P38L player swapped into. It flies straight across me. And it's an easy kill, and that flips the military base to us. Nothing to clear out here, but we are three sectors to two down. So I head towards the airfield. A little bit naughty here, the LA-5 has probably got things well in hand with this Corsair, but he comes within range, so I pop a few shots in, gives me the kill. Swing back up, decide that we might very well change, chase the PE-2. Now I'm short of boost here, so it's actually quite a nasty chase, but fortunately it turns in such a way that I can get shots in it, and then I have to break off because out of nowhere here comes a Corsair. And then as I swing around for the Corsair, I notice the Key 102 is coming in. And I'm a little bit surprised that this ram was successful for the Key 102, although he died as well. A little bit disappointed. So we spawned back in. As we spawned back in, we were three sectors to two down, so I had decided that I needed to capture the local garrison to my right. However, as I spawned in, we took the enemy's airbase. Nevertheless, committed to this course of action, I'm going to execute the plan. The P-40 rather lazily rolls round so that I can shoot it quite easily. Destroy that. Start getting a bead on another one, but before I can do that we flip the sector. There's nothing to clear out here, I have a quick look and now it's back to the middle. So this is the moment in the game when you can look around, assess what the threats are, and what you need to do that will most effectively win the battle for your team.
one thing to reflect upon as we're going in to attack this key 102, which actually dies before I can get to it. I haven't used my ordnance in this game, I haven't needed to. Expect to destroy the Corsair here, but he just manages to swing off to the left and somehow avoid dying. Must have one hit point or thereabouts left, I would have thought. Flies towards the heavy, which is the key 102. It's 12 hit points. They don't last much longer. Key 102 rams the heavy and then it blows up immediately afterwards, depriving me of another chance to kill. I saw the IL-2 coming in as I approached this sector earlier, so I knew it was still around. Come in and finish that off. Hard swing right because I've seen the course of the aircraft coming into the sector. Avoid the cliff face and get on its tail nicely and kill it. And that's the ace. And that was timely because that's the end of the game. And that's 15,000 personal points and a winged legend and Hero of the Sky as well. Let's take a look at this battle's results, and we can see from the centre it's a 5 chevron battle, or a Grade 1 Heavy Fighter, grossing 186,135 credits, silver if you prefer, and just over 62,000 of that came from a premium account bonus. If we look in the message box, we can see there were expenses of 3,250 credits, that was repair costs for losing the aircraft once, I used prepaid consumables, that is I'd bought them in advance in a sale for half price, and moving on to aircraft experience, cute number, 4,000 321 uh, broken down as follows the base 2788 premium account bonus 1394 and 139 coming from other sources 216 free experience base there 146 69 coming from the premium account bonus again no tokens but we can see some achievements here there's the ace and there is the winged legend there is the hero of the sky on the personal score tab, we can see that two of the class specific missions are complete. That for destroying attack aircraft and bombers is three fifths complete. That gives you 13 points, and that's five chevrons. Personal points 15,135 with three sectors captured, 20 aircraft destroyed, exactly the number required for the ace, 6,773 damage to aerial targets, 12 critical hits coming off the uh, machine guns. As I said, we lost the aircraft once and capture points of 480, that was divided into 160 for defending and 320 for attacking. We look on the team score tab, we can see that that would have been enough for first place both by personal points and chevrons on either team. Some solid contributions throughout, most of the players had something uh, worthwhile to contribute to this battle and we were just a little bit cuter in catching, capturing the sectors. That brings me to the end of the review section of the Fisher XP-75 Eagle, a premium I enjoy flying but is a tricky proposition with its low DPS and short range guns. It does have good manoeuvrability but even that's not as much of an advantage as it used to be in these days of XP-54s, twin Mustangs and P-61s. You need to plan where you're going to put this aircraft to maximise its effectiveness. Well I hope you found that useful and that if you did you'll come and see my future content. Please stick around. There's an unnarrated battle at Tier 8, a 5 chevron battle coming up, which I hope you'll also enjoy. But this is where I leave you. So this is the Noble Q, signing out. <laughs>